Oh, look, there's the back of my head. Live streaming to YouTube. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Not okay. Camera, huh? No, I'm not running right. people, but not in I camera. prefer not to be on camera most of the time. <laughs> it was one day I'm like, I can't find my real brush. I okay. Really I think you're well, rolling, friend. You six people or five. Okay. It's all you. Okay. We're rolling. <laughs> so we're recording then. And you guys can, so on the video, they can see the TV and everything. And so does it go back and forth or um, do I have to look at myself? How do I, I not see myself? Just, um, I don't know how to not see myself. Hold on. Okay. There you go. There you go. Perfect. Okay. All right. So uh, welcome to the Cromford Report Overview. Um, there are two pieces to the Cromford Report. Now we have uh, Cromford Public and the Cromford Report. So the difference between the two is uh, where the data comes from. So in the Cromford report, you're gonna have access to all of these tableau charts, analysis snapshots, all of these areas here are all Cromford report. And that is MLS data from the Arizona Regional MLS. Um, Cromford public is right here. If I click on that, all of this is public record sources. And you might ask, what can the public record have that the MLS doesn't have that would be useful to me? And that information is going to be uh, quite a bit, actually. For one, if you've ever wanted to spy on Open Door and Offer Pad, that's going to be in public record because they buy directly from the seller. They don't go through the MLS on their acquisitions. So we can tell you what the Open Door purchases and sales are, Offer Pad. Um, probably soon to be Zillow or whoever else that becomes a big player will probably put it in here under the iBuyer statistics. Cerberus, we were talking about them as a corporate buyer. Uh, they would also probably come in here, although they are purchasing under the, under the MLS, but we can certainly pull them out. Um, anything else that they have purchased outside of that as well. Um, we also pull in the Cromford Public area. You're going to see multifamily and single family permitting which gives us our future supply. So if you've ever heard me give a market update, I pull these permits to see if we're gonna get new supply, where is it going? And so this kind of supply is gonna be over, you know, in the next year, year and a half is when they start getting built. Um, some nice little pieces, average, annual average size of homes sold. And uh, th this can actually do, give you some interesting information on, you know, you know what the the most popular size home is condo or single family um i believe you can probably do that by price range too so you can see by price how how what somebody can afford has been is dropping be a code for us to know what that fa and fe is um all that is is a reference number for us it's like a file number so that um when we're looking if some if you say oh my gosh this this chart isn't loading for me and you send it over to uh, you know support at crawfordreport.com then Mike will ask you what the code is and so if you say FA1 he'll know exactly what chart that is if you say oh the annual average home size we might have multiple charts for home size so um, what's kind of nice about this is you can kind of see I, I think this average home size chart is interesting um, to show that since 2014, basically people really like 1,975 square feet on average. It has been that way for four years. Now, whether or not they can afford 1,975 square feet remains to be seen. So for instance, if you have somebody who can only afford, say, um, between 200 and 225, that is what they lose. When you do a cost of waiting chart, your cost of waiting is square feet. If you can't increase your budget, guess what happens? You buy a smaller home. So uh, right now, for, for homes sold between 200 and 225, if we take this out, we'll take out all your bank owns. Maybe we'll just do um, normal MLS sale. Uh, you're looking at, for 200 to 225, the average size is 1,640 square feet. You go back to May of last year, it was 1,715 square feet. So they lost. Uh, 1,715 square feet was the average for a sale price between 200 and 225 last year. And now it's 640, so they lost 55 square feet. You know how big that is? The size of a king size bed. Or you could say a closet. 
approximately a closet and a half, maybe. Um, so that's where you lose your square footage in your hallways, you lose a little bit of storage space, maybe in your laundry room, they, they find places, but that's how much people have lost um, by waiting over the last year. Um, and, and if you look at new homes, if that's your budget for a new home, you're at, it's been actually stagnant, so it's about 1760. That's not too bad, but guess where you're going, Buckeye. <laughs> or you're getting a townhouse. You can take out single, if you take out townhouse, it actually goes up to 1800, ironically enough. And if you do, if your budget is for a townhouse, then it, that's been shrinking. So it's kind of interesting. You can play around with uh, what your budget buys. Um, pretty cool. And that is, again, that is on our public record site. Um, we've got median values. This is our flip sale section. So we have a map. We have median values by city, and we also have your acquisition versus sale price. And you can include or exclude open door and offer pad. So when you take out open door and offer pad, things change up just a little Why bit. Why don't you explain what median is? Median means that 50% of our sales were above this number, 50% were below. So on the acquisition side, if I were to go, I'll pop in 2016 so we get a little more um, of a trend line here. Take out 2011. So you can see on our flip investors, a flip a flip sale is a, a property that was acquired and sold within a six month period. So you might have a few non flips in there, but for the most pe part, people who are acquiring and selling within six months are considered investors. So 164 means that 50% of our sales, our acquisition sales for flip investors, were below 164.5, and 50% were above. So in order for this to rise, 51% need to be above that number. Does that make sense? And then this is their median sale price. When they go to sell, their median is 215,000. So that means 50% of them were below 215. And 50% were above. That's $50,000 difference in, the, in what they bought it for. And so, yes, so exactly. That's 30%. Yes. Now, when we- 50, 50, Sorry, 50 grand between what they bought and what they sold for? Median, median. That's not good. Oh, uh, yeah, well, it you're, depends. You're a flipper. <laughs> Maybe I'm not understanding. Uh, well, they acquire a property at 164.5. By the time they go to sell it six months later or within six months, you're looking at 215. So 50, um, what is that? Yeah, about $50,000 median. So that's what the, that's what the median flip is. Yeah. But you have to back well, out closing costs, yeah, holding costs, renovation costs. Of course. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I'm saying that's not that good. But anyway, okay. Well, and, and that brings me to open door and offer pad. If we t put them in and look at just them and take out your traditional ones, they would like us to believe that they're not making any money. So that's that, the word on the street. Um, well, that's their way of buying market share is what they're saying. If you believe their acquisition price, okay. yeah, then you will believe they're not making money. So the difference between open door and offer pad is how they record their acquisitions. But not their sales, acquisitions. their acquisitions, huh? It's got to be recorded in tax. It can't be wrong. So this is how it goes. Okay. Regular contract. You know, you go to their title company. Title companies have assistance and people are on autopilot, right, when they're, when they're doing their affidavit of values. So... You get a contract for regular sale, regular buyer, everything else. You have a contract price, you have your earnest money, you have your down payment, and then you have your loan to close, right? Those are the four things you see on the first page. You get one of these guys, open door or offer pad, you have a contract price. And by the way, what goes on the affidavit of value? Contract price. Contract price, earnest money, charges to the seller, cash to close what are they actually spending on that home? The contract price? No, it's contract price minus charges to the seller, right? Because the seller is literally giving them money back and it can be tens of thousands of dollars. In yes. experience, it's an experience. So yeah, so you're saying um, OfferPad sells the house for contract price $200,000. Yes. Um, and then the seller is gonna pay them an 8% fee for the experience. For the experience, mm -hmm. right? So they're recording the 200 grand, but they're yes. really going 
say they take fifteen thousand or percent. Low. Yes, say they charge twenty thousand dollars. Yes, so they actually paid net one eighty. Mm -hmm. Then they go to sell the home for two hundred and ten. How much did they actually make? Ten thousand dollars or thirty thousand dollars? They're making probably just as much as any other investor is. The fifty on median. But what's being recorded, because it's not going through MLS and it's not traditional, and you've got people in title with assistants that are told that contract price is what goes on the affidavit of value. And guess who signs that affidavit of value a lot of times? Not open door and offer pad, it's the escrow officer. And it's supposed to be a, um, basically it's an affidavit. It's saying this is the truthful price that was paid for this home. But because I think of the systematic way things are done, um, I don't want to say that uh, they're not aware of it, because I'm sure they are. But on paper, it looks like they're not making very much money. And, and of course, they're going to say, well, we have to pay you know, a listing agent. We have to pay all of that. And it's like, yeah, well, so does every other investor. So, but they just they record the price they actually pay. You know, That's the thing. Um, I was a lot more upset about it before I found out that a lot of appraisers throw out their acquisitions for these guys. They don't use them. Oh, that's good. Yeah. A lot of the appraisers I talk to, they're like, yeah, no, if we have other comps, we'll use other comps. If that's the only comp, then it's not like they're going to be able to figure out what the uh, concession was, right. you know, from that these guys aren't that transparent. So, they, yeah, they like to make everybody think they're not making money, and then they go to Wall Street, and um, I don't think they can get Wall Street money if you're not making something. <laughs> More than five so, percent. So there's no formula for what they're charging sellers. No. Just based on the condition of the property, what they come up with. There's no way for us to know because they don't have to tell us. Um, just like you guys, we don't. Even when you go through the MLS, we don't know what the listing agent's making, and they could make one percent, they could make three percent, or three and a half, or four percent. We have no idea what they're making, um, and they don't have to tell us. And neither does Open Door, and they can change their model based on the property, based on the area, based on whatever they feel. So. It's really, it's really up in the air. There are people that are like, "What's oh, the average one?" They don't, know. they don't want to tell us. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. unless until there's some kind of uh, change on that level, which I don't know that there's going to be. They're not in a high enough percentage of our overall sales. The overall um, open door and offer pad make up maybe about four percent ish of total volume, and only half of those are going to be their acquisitions. So, give them like two percent. So it's just a, it's a very minimal effect on our overall price lines. If, if they were really starting to affect us, uh, like in 2005, that type of issue, then we would probably be, you know, stomping our feet a lot more. But at this point, it's like, it's I just complain about it, okay? I'm just here to complain. As an analyst, we don't like it. But, you know, that just means that we take them out. We take them out of a lot of our analysis because of that acquisition price is just not reliable at all. It's a it's an arbitrary number because if they say for instance um, they want to keep the value high enough you know over the next six months all they do is they charge another percentage to the seller and they record a price that's high so it's kind of a useless thing um, but you know if anything oops sorry about that if we come back we also have this map so if you want to know where they're buying or where everybody else is buying um, this might be a nice map if you have a um, investor buyer who does want to get into flips or just wants to find out uh, what area might be good to purchase in that has a lot of flip activity so they can get cheap and hold over time. So what this does is it tells us, uh, we'll just do for this year, and we'll go, actually this is up through May, so I need to get this, this particular chart needs to be updated for that May 31st. Um, these are all of our regular buyers. So if I wanted to do just open door and offer pad. That's just their sales this year. Notice all the green? These are your color codes here. Anything green is under 30%. But they're pretty much all over the place, but not in Scottsdale so much. So they're really uh, concentrated. And you can also look at offer, offer pads specifically and see if they have a concentrated effort and open door to see where they're concentrating as well. So you can see they're they're pretty much on these outskirts, West Valley and all over the Southeast Valley. But all of our other buyers, if you wanted to know which areas have the highest percentage gain, we'll just say go over 60%. Now you can see a little bit of a pattern, right? Do you guys see that? 
I zoom out a little bit. There's not, there's a little bit out here in Casa Grande. You've got some out there, but you hover over each one, it'll tell you. This one, acquired for 55,000, sold for 225 in 98 days. David Marshall, <laughs> he did all right. Yeah. But what, what the pattern I see is basically, you've got a lot of Maryvale, a lot of this West Valley in uh, Sun City, Surprise, um, Youngtown and El Mirage, and then West Mesa and Apache Junction and North Chandler. Those are high percentages. Now, if they're all about money though, say they wanna make, I don't know, over $100,000. That's these areas, but see how they're blue? $100,000 for that is 22%. I can't see that part, so what are some oh, of those blue areas? The blues are, it's an indicator of the percentage gain. So these guys, if you go into 85032, you can make $100,000, but you have to invest 565,000 first. Oh, really? Yeah. So this one acquired 565, sold at 687 for a gain of 122, but that was only a 21% gain versus, you know, if they wanted a 60% gain. Does that make sense? Oh. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Thank you, sir. So if you wanted to make 100 <laughs> <laughs> so I mean it, it just really depends on whether what they want whether they want dollar dollar gain or percentage or both so for instance if you said if you had an investor who wants to make at least 60,000 but wants that to be at least 60% of their initial investment instead of being a 10% gain so now again, you're looking all in this little West Valley area, South Phoenix, a little bit of North Tempe, West Mesa, and um, along the 51. This is that 85032 area. So this one acquired 135, sold at 315. Not too shabby. 85032. Yeah, this is like 85028, 032, all in here. Um, you get a little bit of South Scottsdale in the Old Town area. Um, and this little area here, you guys know where Arcadia is? Oh, yeah. So you know where Lower Arcadia is? Then you know where Arcadia Light is? And then, if you want to zoom in on this map, you hover over this little uh, toolbox here, you click on your zoom in, right here. I don't so this is Lower Arcadia, and this is Arcadia Light, and then this is the, I'm across the street from Arcadia. We're not really sure what to call this area. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of in the arm crook of Arcadia, <laughs> snuggling with Arcadia. I don't know exactly what to call it, but um, that's where some we're starting to see a little more. And this again has just been so far flips, successful flips this year. So uh, you can kind of see they're along. Um, that's three four four six East Granada. So that's like 34th Street between 32nd and 34th Street along McDowell. And there's all kinds of little things you can pull, but I think the main advantage to this particular chart or map is if you do have an investor and they want to know where is all the fix and flip activity happening where's most of uh, people getting the biggest bang for their buck uh, this can give you a pretty good idea of where to focus their efforts yeah yeah i'm curious will there be a way to be able to send that to a client and have them be able to click on those dots and see that stuff um if you want to give your power away but they can actually subscribe themselves. And you can, the Cronford Public's available to anybody. Um, we only provide the Cronford Report to real estate agents, and that's through our data license with the MLS. We are not allowed to offer that to your investor clients. But if your investor client wants to sign up for $240 a year, they can have complete access to this whole thing. You don't have to tell them that, though, um, because you're gonna, you're gonna be getting this for much less than $240 a year, and so, if, like through the bundle, if that's what you guys choose to do. Um, but if you wanted to just send this picture, if, if you want them to manipulate it on their own, that's different. But if you just want to send a picture, there's a number of things. You can do a download like this and create an image. And um, of course, I'm not on my, that's what the image looks like there. And you can send that as an email. Or um, if you've got the snipping tool, which I don't know how to find it on here. Hold on. Yeah, sometimes it's tricky. It took me a minute. I know. Uh, I usually do like a search. 
but I don't know this computer very well. But if you can get to the snipping tool, you can take a picture of anything on your screen. Oops, sorry about that. And, um, or you can also do it as a PDF. But I, I recommend if you do the image, you can just copy the image and pop it into an email or pop it into a document that you want to you know, do whatever. Um, but yeah, if you want to offer it to your clients as a, I wouldn't give them your login, I'd make them pay for it. Yeah, <laughs> make them pay for it. So, um, so that's our fix and flip section. And also we've got this last piece, which you might like the best. Uh, it compares city by, by city on uh, fix and flip activity. So again, take out offer pad and open door and maybe do a, a custom date range. We'll just do so far this year. And so you can see all the cities and it's, it's ranked by number of flips. So you've got Phoenix, the median hold time for the city is 89 days. Median games 44.9, 33%. Acquisition price, and then these are your maximums and minimums. So these are your losses, by the way. Somebody lost 80 grand in Scottsdale. Somebody lost 18, but somebody also gained 250,000 this year. So you can rank these however you like. If you want to know what the maximum gain was, it was 985,000 in Paradise Valley. Are those median prices too or not? These are medians. They are medians. Yeah. Okay. This is the minimum, which means that somebody broke even. That's the lowest. Nobody lost money in PV out of the six. And uh, somebody made 965,000 median gain or maximum gain. So, um, so this can give you a lot of information right off the bat. And you can drill it down to zip code if you like. Um, what did I do here, hold on, there we go. So you can drill it down by zip code, percentage gains, you can do all kinds of different things in here and then send it off. So it kind of gives you some pretty good uh, reports. If you've got a, an investor you're trying to lure to represent, then these types of reports I think are gonna be quite unique for them. Um, and then, You've got your basic annual median sales, average square footages, uh, I'm sorry, not average square footage, sales price per square foot. This is the last one I'm gonna show you in this group. It's my favorite for you guys specifically. Average sales price per square foot. To be able to compare the average sales price per square foot for a new home versus an MLS resale versus a flip versus a non-MLS sale, which is a for sale by owner. Um, you can take out all of these guys. These are all bank owns. So say you just want to look at investor flip, new home, normal, and non-MLS. So these are your four. New home, MLS, fix and flip, and your for sale by owner. And now you can say, what's it like for those people that are in a 200 to 300,000, say? The lower range. Guess what's lowest? New homes. Wow, really? I know. That's amazing. That's crazy. I know, because that, guess where they are? Buckeye. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they're in Buckeye and South Phoenix. <laughs> yeah. And they're out in Pinal County. They have to drive, right, right. but they'll get yeah. more square footage and they'll yeah, get exactly. something new. Now, if you were to say, um, let's take it out of the two to three and put it into three to five. Now, Look at your for sale by owner versus your new home, and then we'll just pop it into, I don't know, what do you want to try? Gilbert, Mesa? Queen Creek. Queen Creek. Why can't I do the alphabet? There we go. So, I know, look at that. So if you don't want to have your fix and flip guys in there, if you've got something <laughs> that's like, oh, that's a little wonky, and maybe you don't want to have your for sale by owners in there, you can still use that. But um, this just shows if you've got a listing in there and you're trying to convince your seller that the new homes are a major competitor to them right now, you're in Queen Creek. Why not buy new if they're on average the dollar per square foot is lower than a resale for this price point between three and five hundred thousand? It just kind of goes to show if you're trying to get a price reduction, you know, it kind of helps you out in that area. It might be different if we go say let's try Gilbert. Gilbert is different. So in Gilbert, it's there's definitely a premium for going new, but Queen Creek. So now you've got two complete, you've got two neighbors, essentially, and then you've got two different scenarios where they might be passing through Gilbert. They're like, I don't know why these homes are, you know, competing with me. They're much, you know, they're more expensive, but not in Queen Creek. They're not. So, so that's why I like this particular chart. 
it, it really helps out and you can also pop in your investors and your for sale by owners see what they look like in Gilbert I mean look at that your fix and flips and your for sale by owners are mm. tight yeah. in there wow. that's so weird I know it gives you a lot of information doesn't it yes. and you can play around by zip code you can play around you know you can take out townhouses do just single family um, or you can do just townhouses and condos if you're looking for that but I think this particular piece um, can create some good content for your blogs, just for conversation pieces. Mm -hmm. Did you tell us what the agent pricing is for this? Um, normally it's $240 for a year. Um, with a Cromford Report subscription, it goes to $150. That's what we gave you guys. Uh, and then it's gonna go lower with your within your group. Yeah, it's gonna go lower than $150. So, I mean, I. I gather to say it's probably going to be approximately an extra ten bucks a month, maybe something like that with the group, depending on how many people oh, okay. go in the group. And then, do you have? Is this pretty user friendly right off the bat? Do you have trainings on this? Um, well, yeah, I think I think Cromford Public's a little bit more user friendly than the Cromford Report is because we give you a little brief view of what the chart looks like for one. We don't have as much commentary on this side, though. Again, this is for the public, so we don't give them as much. Here is we give you guys in the real estate side. Mm -hmm. um, so they're kind of on their own for figuring it out, what it's saying, but I think for adding on, you know, investor type stuff, especially especially if you've got somebody who is acquiring from, from for sale by owners and flipping with you, or you're acquiring for for sale by owners, or, mm -hmm. or you're trying to compete with open door and offer pad, you want to use something like this to show what the gap is between an MLS sale and, you know, a for sale by owner, then that might be quite helpful. Anyway, and just bear in mind that those for sale by owner lines don't even take into account all the charges that some of those investors are charging those sellers under that number. So it's probably even a bigger gap. And being able to do it by price point is really powerful too. So um, I know I don't have a whole lot of time with you guys today, so I want to make sure that for those of you who are not familiar with the Cromford Report, um, for what's existing in your subscription on the real estate side we have a couple of things that help uh, people just getting started and also for the listing presentation so what I want to do is start off with a little marketing piece that comes out every month and uh, that is called the infographic how many of you guys have seen the infographics out there okay a handful you might recognize it when you see it, it looks like this a lot of people like to put them out on social media been around for a few years now um, but what makes these very popular they come out right around the sixth or seventh of the month uh, so I just did I did this one early it doesn't always happen and um, and then it has the commentary at the bottom so and I, I pick something different every month so um, the infographic will stay the same you get about six stats so it gives them something familiar. And then every single month, these are designed to be short so that if you send it through your you know, uh, MailChimp or something like that and somebody sees it on their phone through their email, then it's not too wordy, it's not too long. Yeah. yeah. So this one is basically just stating that um, the cost of waiting, what I just told you guys, cost of waiting means less closet space or a higher payment. Um, and then it says that the builders are building a little bit more this year under in the low 200s than they did this time last year. They're at 35% and what they've sold um, in the low twos. They're, but they're not going under two at all. And then for sellers, it's just letting them know about the seasonality of the market right now. We're not expecting to see any big boosts in buyers between now and the end of the year. And so these are just nice little conversation pieces. Um, they're not always positive. They're not always negative. They're just kind of, they are what they are. But they're designed to try to um, create some conversation for you guys. So. If somebody looks at this and says, dang, well, it sounds like we're not going to get any buyers till the next end of the year. I'm going to call my agent and tell them that they're, you know, smoking crack. Why should I, why should I list? I mean, that's a, still a phone call, right? So you're just really trying to generate a phone call on that stuff. Um, and that's under here. You can use the PDF, put it on an open house or something like that, or you can uh, copy paste the text in here. And then we have the infographic as a, a separate JPEG that you can upload. And that's more, like I said, it's just a touch piece, a marketing piece. When you get the listing, though, how many of you guys use the listing presentation dashboard? Two, all right. The listing presentation dashboard is, if this is the only thing you learn how to do, 
it is probably the most powerful piece um, and you'll you'll set yourself apart right off the bat and the reason I say that is because anytime somebody gives me a, a problem listing or a problem buyer or a problem area this is the first thing I go to myself to see if there's anything obvious so it's located under tableau charts and it's also located under dashboards so you can get it in two different places and when you click on it scroll down and you'll see this little dashboard link there you click on that and it will open up a worksheet so um, I'm gonna start off with my own problem listing and then you guys can I'll show you what happened with me and then if you have any other buyers or areas that you want me to look at we'll do that so I have Michael Orr's home listed for sale shameless plug um, <laughs> in the 800s and uh it's got a price reduction it's 875 um but i needed to know what happened after we listed because after we listed it like got one showing that just died everything looked like you what happened not really well you know what i know i'm on video <laughs> i think you guys all know this Perfectly logical people, analytical people, can become very emotional when selling their own home. <laughs> I know. When you raise your family and your wife loves the faux paint and you make them paint it, <laughs> you make them give away all the furniture because it's British furniture. It's not contemporary furniture. Um, you know, they can get they can get a little emotional about it. And um, you know, and who doesn't want to try to get the most for their home, right? So we're in the 800 uh, to 950 range. So right now it's at 875. Um, click on normal. This is set on single family residence. And this is how I got my price reduction, by the way. So if we scroll down, I know. I'm like, I'm having to tell my mentor what's happening. I'm telling my mentor. I hope Mike never sees this video. Uh, and so we come down to Mesa. So I click on Mesa as a city first. What is the first thing you guys see there? Guess when I listed? I listed right here. That's where I listed. What happened right after I listed that property? Six more listings came on the market and, what, and we were down here. So while, while we were waiting, between April and July, we had 17 listings between 800 and 950 come on the market competing with us. Did we get any more buyers? No. We didn't get more buyers with our listings. We only got more listings. So if you're competing for, by the way, this is six months of sales. So uh, we're at 5, 15, 21, 27 divided by six is what? Can we do the math here? Uh, four, five, four, four. People, people don't want to buy just because it's Michael Orr's house. I know, right? I think so. Because doesn't everybody know? And well, when I first said it's Michael Orr's house to a, a general person, they think it's the football player. That's what we think. Right? It's not him. No. That's why I'm joking around about the movie Blindside. Except, right. I don't know who Michael Orr is. I don't know who. Yeah, that name's not familiar to me at all. Michael Orr? Yes, yes. Neither one. Okay, okay so um, Michael Orr is my business partner. He co founded the Crawford Report. He's a, um, he's a mathematician from Oxford. Oh, wow. He designed all of our charts. And he has done all of the pricing. So he and I run the Cromford Report together and he runs it from England now. He moved to England last year. And so his big 5,700 square foot mammoth of a house is now available for sale. Mm -hmm. And um, okay, so now we make now we're like. Yeah, but there's also Michael Orr, the football player that played for Baltimore years ago. And that's what most people think. Uh, yeah. But it's, there's uh, one is O-R-R -R and one is O. Side, I have. He was the football player of the Bronx side. That's not, right. That house would be gone by now. It was his house. Right? Yeah. Who knew he would have been in Mesa? A right. sleepy town in Mesa. Right. So anyhow, um, this is the entire city of Mesa, okay? If I wanted to look just at his zip code, which is 85213, um, and then I'm going to pick a neighbor, 15, and I'll pick another neighbor, 205. You can see that of that increase, again, I, I listed right around here. We had four more listings come on the market, and we've only sold three homes in the last six months in that price point. It's directly surrounding him. So what this did, right away, I could tell 
that the reason things got slow was because our competition increased. Um, that spurred me to go into the MLS and find out where they were, what has actually sold in the last six months, and then, and then build my case from there. But this particular piece right away t told me where to start, right? And um, turns out there's a new home subdivision right close by there. <coughs> so does anybody else have an area they, they're curious about or a price point that they're curious about? Showing a buyer, yes. Well, I have a two, huge two-story casita in Sun Lakes. Okay, so huge two-story casita in Sun Lakes. Okay, so is it considered a single family or is it considered a townhouse? Single condo? family. Okay, what's the price point? Uh, we've got it at 420. So it's at 420,000. We're gonna, first we'll, we can look at 400 to 500 or 400 to 450, see what works out for that. Um, so sometimes I'll start off with a $50,000 gap just to see how many we get. Mm -hmm. And I assume there's no HUDs or REOs or short sales in there. No. And if we scroll down to Sun Lakes. <coughs> just click on the city or you can click on the zip code, it doesn't matter. This tells me, I'm gonna go down just a little bit so you can see all three charts on one page. Your supply is a little bit down and I assume you're one of these. If there's eight active for sale, that you're one of them, between yeah. four and four fifty. Um, I'll zoom in just a little bit so you can see here. This is your monthly sales are actually not too bad. We sold six last month, ten the month before, but we had two of the best months that we've had in seven years. So we can't necessarily count on that, right? Um, if we look at the last six years, we're really happy to get about three a month selling, which isn't bad for eight listings. So your supply is not bad. Um, but what I have to see here is that your prices are not rising. They're not rising. They're not rising. They've been flat. So when did they buy their home? Well, years ago. Before 2012? Yes. Before 2005? I want to say, I don't remember, 2006, mm -hmm. eight, somewhere in there. So they're in good shape. So basically what this tells us is that at contract, these last six months of sales with numbers on them, the average price per square foot at contract was 167 and the average sale price was 166. So it's very tight on the negotiating gap. You're not really looking at um, price, meaning that you, know, you think your home's gonna be, this is not market value. This is just telling us that we're looking to see if the the lines are rising or if they're flat or declining and is this gap closing or widening that's your that's your seller advantage does that make sense so are you saying that the other factors that play a role in Sun Lakes in particular old people don't like two stories and old right. people don't want 3600 square foot homes they're downsizing are two mm -hmm. huge factors in why the house isn't selling yeah. that mm -hmm. won't show up on that Charter. Yeah, not necessarily. This just tells us, because again, we haven't smelled all of these properties that yeah. we don't know what kind of finishes they have, what kind of views they have, yeah. what kind of lot size. We don't know anything. All we know is that of these successful sales, the sweet spot was 167 at contract, the list price That's per square foot. foot. And the, the sweet spot for selling was 166. That's all that tells us. But it does tell us that um, if you're going low in supply, and we have good demand and you're not getting a contract, it's most likely price. Most likely. Yeah, but they're way below that. They're at 120 a square foot. And again, this is an average. It's av, I know. It's not gonna be a fun conversation. I didn't no. say, we couldn't, we can't give you fun conversations. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, speaking of Sun Lakes though, let me um, back up just a second and go back to Cromford Public. This might be very helpful for you in that um, specifically because you're in Sun Lakes, all of these have uh, an option for 55 plus communities as oh, well. Nice. Yeah, so for instance, if you were to come back to this 12 month moving supply here, um, I just wanna point this out because I forgot to tell you guys about it. Um, see where it says 55 plus age restricted, age targeted? You can take out your normal and uh, we'll take out, take out all the other junk. But you can see here, too, you can follow um, just for just for age-restricted and age-targeted communities. You can pull those out. 
And what are those three lines? This, uh, uh, this is new home, okay, left. MLS sale, and investor flip. Gotcha. Okay. And you can, yeah, and, and this goes with all of your cities, and so you can also do four to five. So, I mean, just one more thing that I yeah. just forgot to tell you guys about it, because age-restricted has always been one of our big uh, requests, especially in Mesa, since usually we're like, well, Sun Lakes is easy, yeah. Sun City is easy, right. but you get the city of Mesa, and, and to have an age-restricted specific stat is, is a, an asset. So, um, all right, so let's go back real quick to our listing presentation dashboard any other does anybody have a buyer they want to look at future buyers let's do a temp we're gonna do a hypothetical buyer then so what do you think most buyers are coming in at where do they want to buy at under three so we're gonna look at uh, the 200 let's say 250 hmm? 250 to 300,000 and see what's happening in the market that they're swimming in. So, so far, and let's just look at normal. Let's assume they don't want a HUD or REO or short sale. Um, in the entire valley, in all of the MLS, we only have single family between 250 and three, we only have 1,630 active listings with no contract on them. Um, last month, we sold 1,400. The month before that, we sold 1,479. So we're hovering pretty high for the level of, of listings we have. What, and, what does that equate to uh, supply-wise? Sup well, you can you can take this if you want to do a quick calculation. Um, it's actually almost easier to do a... Uh, let's see if we just took last month. Oops, 1630. We also have a chart, by the way. Do you? Mm -hmm. I meant to hit... The Hold on, I'm not on my um, my own computer, so I'm having a hard time. <laughs> Hold on, <laughs> I'm hitting all the wrong buttons. It's one month supply. So you just divided one point one. Yeah. You did six, sixteen whatever the inventory was by yeah. one sold. And just last month's. I mean, that's essentially what a month supply. Who is that? Is that me? Or is that the computer? Okay, got it. So, uh, yeah, it's basically whatever was sold last month <laughs> and into that. We have another chart that gives us day's inventory, which is actually a better one. Mm -hmm. But if you want to do just a quick little calculation, that's how you do yeah. on supply. Yeah. And then, again, you want to see, notice how the lines are going up and then the gap is getting small. That means that the seller's advantages are, are getting better. Or they're just getting stronger. Um, if we were to take this out and say, uh, oh, I've got a buyer who wants anything in Chandler, now look how tight that is. Now you only have 75 and we sold 105. That's less than a month's supply in Chandler. But you know, here's your good news, your ray of hope. Look at supplies going up. Woo, ray of hope there. <laughs> you know, if somebody's complaining, you say, hey, listen, two months ago we only had 52. <laughs> in all of Chandler, the whole city of Chandler. 52? And 52 active for sale. And between two of uh, fifty and three hundred thousand, so we're in a pretty small gap. Uh, and this is one of the reasons we don't do, by the way, um, subdivision. You don't do what? We don't do subdivision because when you're trying to get a, if say for instance I go and I say, uh, let's look at just one zip code, it can get um, it can get a little tight. I mean, look at this. We only had four sales in all of January. We only had one in 2012. So when you're doing long-term trending, you get really ugly charts when you get too small. But this is actually a pretty decent price point. Uh, we have a, a pretty good number, and that tells your buyer right away something, doesn't it? Like, don't lowball. Hello, people, don't lowball. This is, you know, if you get somebody who is like, I love negotiating, that's what I do in my country. You're like, yes, you won't do that here. Yeah. Not gonna. <laughs> that's the seller here today. <laughs> So you only have 24 listings and you sold 34 of them last month and 44 the month before and you see this, the price line at 162 versus 161 is really, really tight and rising 
that tells your buyer something right there not to not to take this market for granted um, now it could get a little bit different if we were to say take this up to 350 to 400 mm -hmm. oops that's 40,000 <laughs> hold on and so actually this isn't a bad line is it you just have 11 active for sale sold 10 last month that's really good and that's also really tight but it's not nearly as dramatic though you know the the uh, rise it's rising that's good for those sellers oh and we're in Chandler just one zip code still by the way we could go to all of Chandler and see what that looks like and again we're seeing a rise and we're seeing a gap and you could do this for different price points and see how the market shifts by price point um, especially if you could get say over a million or um, even under 200,000 might look different and this is all available on the public site now this is actually the Cromford report site this is, okay. yeah because Cromford public will not have active listings for okay. sale and that's where your advantage really comes in is when you can pull actives that's great this is your condos I was just curious about condos so that's another thing of now that the luxury condos are emerging you can do this same thing for the, the condo market and see what that looks like and you can select multiple cities just by hitting the control key and um, selecting multiple cities or multiple zip codes so I'll do Chandler and Gilbert combined and see what that looks like so between 300 and 400 thousand you've got 32 active listings pretty stable across the top but the good news is we've had more sales in 2018 than we've ever had and a pretty tight line so when you're ready to print something then this is an important piece you want to make sure that you hover over whatever you've selected and select keep only so whether that's a zip code or a city you select keep only and what that should do see how it just puts them both at the top it takes out everything else and you do that because when you go to print this it they will get shoved down and you won't remember what you picked and your client won't be able to see what you picked so you want to make sure that they are all visible and then you hit this little download button in the lower corner and select PDF and it's already formatted oh what I guess we'll reset the view so we'll hit that then PDF create PDF download and then it shows up if you're using Chrome it shows up here in the lower corner and it will print just like that now remember I had to reset the view so I didn't do that but only your criteria will show yes um, and because this is Tableau can you drill down further to see like which of those can you go to write down those listing itself no okay. uh, we are not allowed to drill down to that level and that's okay. part of our data license as well okay. um, but if you get down to a small enough number you know if you only have eight listings you can literally go to the MLS and find out where they are yeah you, you start drilling in really short basically it's just I use this just to give them a um, just an overview so the way I would use this particular um, piece is in conjunction with your CMA you know, if you're using our RPR or whatever you're using and you've, you've done all of your research on their subdivision um, this is basically saying okay I think your home's gonna sell somewhere between say 350 and 400,000 this is the competitive market analysis for the area for your price point this is what your competition's doing it's going up or going down or flat this is how many buyers per month we've we are competing for so you know you notice on mine in the 800 and 950 I'm selling a half a deal a month so don't expect to have a flood of showings right so it sets the expectation and then this is what your prices are doing when you do get a contract um, and this is good for a buyer or a seller we can see that once you get really close to what to market value you will get a contract very close to what you're asking for um, in this price point and so if you're not getting it you know if you're looking let's let's do an actual example here let's do um do you guys didn't have one you want to put out like even for your own home or your own zip code no 8.140 okay thanks what's your price point 
Um, three hundred. Okay. So let's do two hundred and fifty to three hundred and fifty for a five one four zero, which is Santan Valley. And where where I am in there though is Queen Creek. I don't know if that matters. This is great. I'm actually really ha I'm grateful that you brought this up because the problem with Queen Creek is that Santan Valley is Queen Creek. Um, Santan Valley is a name we give an area similar to Ahwatukee, which is technically Phoenix, but they don't like to be called South Phoenix. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so they were like, we're not South Phoenix, we're Ahwatukee. But the government, the postal service is like, you're Phoenix. So when we get our data, it's Phoenix. But if you're trying to isolate Santan Valley or isolate Queen Creek on the Maricopa side, you pick the zip code, this is what you have to do. And that's why we have county here. Okay. So what you do is it's a, it's a cheat in a way. It's not going to be exact, especially now that we're dealing with annexed potential stuff. Yeah, I never know what to put on my I know, now. right? <laughs> but I mean, this is the best we can do at yeah. this point. You can select Queen Creek, all of it, if you like, and then you can come up here and select, deselect Pinal County. And you'll just get the Maricopa side of Queen Creek. And then if you want to select 85140, you can drill it down a little farther there. And then I'm going to go normal transactions, take out our short sales and our HUDs and all that. So 49 listings, that is actually up. This is last year, July, oh, wow. July 10th of 2000 last year, we had 39. Same time now, we have 49. So that is a 25% increase in supply. That's very good news for your buyers, by the way. Um, but we've also increased quite a bit in the number of sales. So 49 actives, we sold 26 last month and the month before we sold 34, which is the biggest month ever. Um, what happened to my price? What the heck? Hold on, reset. I don't know what happened to my price line. That's unusual. So go back here to 250 to 350. You make sure my price loaded, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I will pick just Maricopa side and then we're going to come down again to Queen Creek see we do this over and over again so you guys will remember and then 85140 what happened to my price? It, oh well, because that's on the Santan Valley side yeah. Santan Valley my, okay. my zip code is 85140 we got annexed into Queen Creek but we are still Pinnell all right, so now I'm going to pop over to Pinal County then. <laughs> so, or you can do all and then just select A5140. You'll get the whole zip code. Okay. Um, so now you've got 41 to 50, still a pretty 25% jump. 50, sold 26, um, but look at your price is actually lower than it was in 2012. Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Still really tight but not great. So say for instance, they bought in 2012, they may or may not actually make that much money. And the, unfortunately, the, the reason for that could be that there's so much new home construction competing. Remember how we saw the dollar per square foot and new yeah. homes were lower? Yeah. Um, so it could be that even though we have more demand and even, but we have more supply, um, it's, it doesn't seem to be relating into your sale dollar per square foot mm. but you're having a great year transaction wise. <laughs> but that's you know but that's kind of your reality check and the thing with these is that they're updated every day this was just updated uh today so uh, it's going to be up to date it's going to be for their price point for their zip code so whatever they read in the paper about seven and a half percent appreciation um you know you can say well yeah maybe seven and a half from the bottom here we went from 103 to 111, so that's really good appreciation, but that doesn't mean you got it from 2012 when you bought it, necessarily. So, um, just food for thought on that. But again, um, if you're looking for Santan Valley, and we'll pick a, just go from 0 to 350 or something, pick a broader price point. So that's how, I mean, look how tight it's like yeah super tight on the, on the Pinal side and that's zero to 350 single family so it's um, and a declining supply line 
So again, you can see how this will give you a whole lot of information just in one page. If, again, if this is all you use, you're doing extremely well. So a couple of other areas to point out, if, you're, if you don't have a listing presentation and you don't really feel like doing your marketing today, but you wanna get into the comfort report, maybe find out some extra stuff for a blog post or anything else, Come over here to um, your news and commentary or on the home page you can find them here too. We've got daily observations and news and commentary. And we do have subscribers that all they do is like maybe once a week over their coffee, they log in and they read the daily observations. And what that is is whatever we happen to be looking at that day. And you can get all kinds of neat little blog pieces for this or just uh, conversation pieces. But he's addressing the lack of supply by area um, and you can see overall in Greater Phoenix we're down 30 percent in listings under 250 and you can see how that compares to the West Valley, Southeast Valley, Pinal County and so on. Um, so you'll get a lot of little offshoot pieces here. We also have that list price versus sale price that was such a popular piece on our um, listing presentation dashboard that we were asked <laughs> to separate it out. So we have it separate I'll just open it up in a new tab here for you. But you can see it under Tableau charts right here, list price versus sale price. And what this does is I have not only the six month moving average, but a 12 month moving average. And, and you can select condos, mobiles, homes, single family here. Um, and I'm just gonna say, look up to 250, 200 to 250. And this is where um, if you get into a very small zip code, let's pick, um, what's a good zip code for this price point? Maryvale, which is, I know you guys don't know where that is. I do. It's 031-3335, the zip codes. Look at Maryvale, my goodness. Um, there's not a lot of data. See how ugly that is? If we go to a 12 month moving average, now we've got 12 months of sales in each one of these. So you can see that gap is actually tightening up right there. You can see where it gaps here. That's when we went into a balanced market. Do you guys remember 2014? We went to a balanced market and so um, sellers, the gap, the negotiating gap, um, and it has only been getting tighter, tighter, tighter. And now in July, it's the tightest it's been in a long time. Um, you can take out condos if you want. You can do normal transaction types. Oh, I lost my um, I lost my zip codes. Let's go with uh, let's do a city instead. Oh, in the two to two fifty? Wow, is there stuff? Yeah, there's stuff in there for two. Well, let let's let's go over. Let's say three to five or three to four hundred thousand in Amatuki. Can you do just Awatuki? Yep, you can do just Awatuki because they are three zip codes. So what you do is you come into the zip code area and it's 85044, 45, and 48. And now that's three to 400 in Awatuki and it's very tight, it's getting tight again. And then you've got median percent of lists, that's new. Does that include Foothills too? Yes, eight, that's Foothills is in uh, eight five zero. Which are you looking at the ones over by the golf course? Oh, Altuki Foothills. Yeah, yeah, Altuki, yeah, that's zero four eight. Are you talking about that little one too? That little one. There's like a little zip code. I, I don't even know about that little zip code. I'm just. I'm just <laughs> I just know there's three. Altuki I just know there's three of them. If I have zero four 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 eight, it looks like this one. I need to. I need to update this one. I had started. I had started this one, but I haven't finished it. But um, you said four, 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 six, and four, eight. Four, 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 five. Four, five, and four, eight. Yeah. Okay. And so um, again, this one is uh, this is nice if all you want is that one little price point. And it's cool because it goes back to 2008 instead of 2012, like on the other one. So it kind of gives them an idea of that if they bought in the last 10 years, they're doing pretty well right now. Okay. So I have a question because when we hit the rock bottom, you know, they, we, everybody was telling us it was going to take us about 10 years mm -hmm. to get out. And I, what was it? It was, was it two or three years? 
the rock bottom say? we hit um so the question is that i remember for the first time to actually repeat the question uh, the question is <laughs> from the rock bottom how long did it take us to recover and that's going to need to happen from a um well first of all we have to define what what is recovery and the best chart to show where how far we is, we've come is a long-term chart so under tableau charts i'm going to take you to average sales price per square foot long term and so if you are a realtor or a homeowner you consider recovery especially if you purchase in six oh five or oh six you consider recovery being getting back to this peak of the market um, of course if you're a realtor you also want the transaction volume of 2005 2005 was the biggest year for transaction volume but 2006 and 7 were peak for price so uh, but if you're an analyst we're back to recovery when we get back to where we were supposed to be anyway on the historical right. line and that's actually where we are here when we hit May at 164 a square foot that was the 3% line starting from 2000 up to here and Steve Chater showed us something on success where you had some little green where it's the two to three percent yeah I broke it out between mm -hmm. year and that would show that we are actually right at three percent on track of what we should be doing here. we are right where we're supposed to be but, but we are going to overshoot that we are, yeah, yes I we're gonna we're gonna overshoot how do you get that little I drew it on oh, <laughs> I drew it on okay. but you can find it under downloads so if we come down to downloads and you can also find it, I've, I've started up a little video collection, but you can, um, any of these, I, I should probably get a new one in there for July, but a lot of these will have it. So if I click on, um, I might have it under Pinnacle Peak on RMS Tour, it's a North Scottsdale one, but I think I do a little bit of overview on that. It's usually at the end, there, there they are, see it? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah. So generally just click on the last presentation that I did and you'll see that um, we hit that 3% line and that's why all of these uh, overvalued headlines were coming in. So if you ever miss a, a presentation, you can always look to see or even just email me and say, you know, can I have your last presentation? But so are you, would you say we've recovered now? Um, we, we have definitely before? recovered. Um, and I would say that it took a decade. You, did, you do agree with that? Mm -hmm. We have recovered. Now, um, that doesn't mean that there aren't some red flags going on in, in the future, <laughs> but it does mean that we're not concerned right now. But this is what we look at. Um, see, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, I've already gone over, two. it's 2.15, so I'm just checking with you guys. How are you feeling? Does anybody need to go? All right. <laughs> um, one of the things we look at, to, that reason we know that prices are going to continue to go up, is that we look at the Cromford Market Index. And the Cromford Market Index right here is, I'll look at the long-term chart. This shows us the history of our seller markets and our buyer markets. And um, when you're in balance, you can expect your annual appreciation rate to follow the rate of inflation. Our current rate of inflation is 2.5%, the last I checked. And the long-term average between 2001 and 2018 is 2.1%. So anything right around 2 to 3% is kind of considered happy for our for, for balanced everyday market. So in 2002 through 2003, our, that's why a lot of our charts show off that with the 2 to 3%. Um, this is what a bubble looks like. This is what a crash looks like. <laughs> Um, this started happening in 2005, but as long as you're above this balance line, you are going to be getting a positive appreciation rate. It's just declining from 45% to 35% to 20% to 15%. So nobody, notice, nobody notices as long as the price is going up, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't until we hit balance towards the fourth quarter of 2005 that people were like, something's happening, what's happening? I only have... What do you mean I don't have 17 competing offers? I only have one offer and they want a concession, right? That's what happened by the fourth quarter when literally five months prior, they would have had 97 competing offers for their home. 
and that's why they just people just did not know this was happening. Then in 2006 and seven, that's when we peaked in price, but you're in a buyer's market at the peak of price. And so here we are, we have been in a prolonged seller's market. It is not a bubble like this, but it has, this is the result of a chronic supply shortage that's just been getting worse and worse and worse due to lack of building. And so they're trying to build as fast as they can, but in the meantime, we are in this seller's market. And when you are above 110, you will get greater than the rate of inflation for your appreciation rates. So where are we right about now? Like, on average, we're about 8%, eight, seven and a half, eight percent um, Until this comes down to balance, we are not going to see our prices do anything but go up. As it comes down, if it does, it hasn't started yet, but if it starts to come down, you will still see a positive appreciation rate. It just won't be 7.5%. It might be 6%, it might be 5.5%. Still decent, still greater than the rate of inflation, but it will be a reflection of that declining market. It will happen three to six months after that. So in order for us to see, say, um, when we hit balance, prices will not go down at balance, they go flat at balance. And so for us to even see prices go flat, we have to see this Crawford Market Index go down first. And that could take, even if it does this, remember 2013? How many of you guys are around for 2013? That is a, that's alarming, isn't it? We all got a little bit scared because it looked a lot like this. This was when the Canadians pulled out, when the, when the exchange rate um, went unfavorable for them and they switched from being buyers to sellers. And so it took the Cromford Market Index, and, it, and that took one, two, three, four, five months still for that, and that was an alarming rate. So if we were to do that, it would still take us to the next, into the later part of this year before we would see that, and that is an abrupt change, right? Mm -hmm. So say for instance that happens, just throwing it out there. If that were to happen, your prices won't respond to that for three to six months after, because Prices don't tell us where we are, they tell us where we've already been. So the price response to the Cromford Market Index is a three to six month gap. So that's why we're saying the earliest possible shift in prices we would possibly see probably middle of next year, if it's gonna happen. That's when you think a market correction might start. If happen. it happens at all. If it happens. If it happens. Now, it, but I think the correction, I don't think the correction is gonna look like this. I think it's gonna be a gradual decline which would cut, take us even farther in, yeah. Yeah. right? And it really depends on where, what, what part of uh, price points that they're gonna focus on, you know? So and Tina, from your perspective, barring some massive world crisis or even a U.S. crisis of some kind, uh, another 9-11, if you will, mm. something like that, we look like we're in a stable or growth market mm -hmm. for probably at this point in time next 18 months or so unless something bizarre happens that's going to shake the whole world up well there are some things that we're watching right now um that you know most when it comes to luxury this year one of the reasons we've been doing so well especially in dollar volume is because the luxury markets come back and the luxury market cares about, corp and we're talking about people who make over $2 million. They don't really care about the job market. They certainly don't care about interest rates, right? So those are not indicators for them at all. What is an indicator for whether or not somebody wants to release some of their liquid funds and put it into a non-liquid asset like a home is um, how is their company doing for corporate profits? How do they feel about their future corporate profits? And how's the stock market doing? which is their retirement, which could be their, their, off, their options that they have, all these packages that these types of buyers will have. And exchange rates, in a, in a sense too, if they're doing international business, and the exchange rate will affect how they feel about their corporate profits moving forward. So what we've been experiencing with the tariff situation, um, when we look at, I'll just give you one stat in here, the listings under contract for the luxury market. Hold on, I clicked on the wrong thing. 
What price point are you doing for budget? Over a million. You could even do over two. Um, let's see what it looks like over a million. See how it, it was really high and then it came down relatively sharply. This is four weeks. This is so you start talking about tariffs, like they were being we we're very optimistic. Last year they they the corporate profits were already going up, then they issued the tax reform which was very positive for corporate profits because they, they gave them more tax breaks. So lots of optimism. And so corporate profits were going up, the stock market was going up, the luxury market was going up. Now we've got a lot of uncertainty going on right now with the, the negotiations with all, on all sides of us, the EU, Canada, Mexico, and China. And so um, what happens is our society, general human nature, is such that we can handle small changes and acclimate as we go. Too much, too fast, and we freeze, like deer in the headlights. Right. And you can, you can apply this also to your interest rates. As you guys know, buyers can handle small increases in the interest rate. It'll even get them off the fence. Like, oh, we see a boost in demand when we see the interest rate go up, ironically enough. But if they go up too much, too fast, people freeze. Yeah, they pull back. You, you scare the bunnies when you do that. And so um, I think that in terms of you don't need to have a catastrophe like 9-11. You can just have some amount of uncertainty, temporary or not, uh, because they can't make a decision right now on their, on their liquid funds to put it into a large asset if they don't know what's going to, how it's all going to pan out on this. And um, it can it can affect jobs. It's already affecting some jobs, whether it's permanent or temporary. People don't really know, so that might be one of the pullbacks that we'll see. And that doesn't necessarily mean, in order for it to truly affect us, though, it has to last for longer than a season. It has to last longer than three months. <laughs> if it lasts for more than six months, we'll start to see maybe uh, some reaction to it. But in the short term, right now, I think what we're seeing are some people just deer in the headlights, like, I don't know which way to go right now. So the fall elections may or may not interject that uncertainty into the market. Yeah, what we, what we need is a certain amount of certainty to where they can make a decision. And, and I mean, already the corporations are you know, <coughs> having to recalibrate what their plans were. And they, if you don't know where your corporate profits are doing and your 401k is kind of, or your, your uh, stock market's gone flat. It's not crashing, it's just gone flat. So even the stock market's like, I don't think we're just going to stay here for a while. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, th those are some things that are, they're not catastrophic right now, but they can affect somebody's decision to buy. Oh, I've gone way over. I can always stay though, you're my only appointment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. of, course. <laughs> uh, of course, as realtors, we always say, by now, based on what we know right now, oh, always. anything else is, is conjecture. So, if well, you do something, do it now. I that's do the only thing we know exactly what's going on. It's actually a good time to be a buyer. Very good time to be a buyer. If everybody is scared and you're you're not feeling so you know scared yourself, it's it's not a bad time because uh, you have fewer buyers out there to compete with, and we are heading into our slow season. So, we have a lot a lot of charts in here. I um, highly recommend that you come to a market update if you can. Um, and we send out a monthly update on where I'm going to be speaking and then you guys can always have access to the PowerPoints as well. Um, but I go over a lot more charts than we did today. It's just that most of the charts we have are not going to have a huge impact for you until you're in a listing presentation or until you've got one of those clients that is super analytical and asking all kinds of questions. Yes? You know how you mentioned last year versus this year the square footage, you know, for the 200 to 225 that yes. went down. Do you see a direct correlation between the interest rate climbing and the square footage? Oh, absolutely. I mean, is it sort of like a formula? Oh, um, a quarter percent, half percent is means 50 square feet across all of our price points. I can tell you that. Per I've done what? that. Per interest? That's your loss. Uh, no, it's, it's basically what you can afford. And the interest rate does have a certain amount in there, but it's uh, if you, it all will affect it in the, the smaller house. So the thing is, the interest rates don't necessarily take somebody out of the market. They're still no, but qualified. They, but like you said, they qualify for less, so mm -hmm. they have to buy a smaller home. Yeah. Right? I was just mm -hmm. curious, like, if the interest rate raised a half a percent, what would that 
what would that equate to in square feet? Is there a correlation? I don't know. Yeah. Because um, because all your home all your price points right. are going to be different sizes, um, and an increase could pop you down a size. So say for instance you were you were in the 225 to 250 range. Well now you've been dropped down to the 2 to 225 range, and those square footages are going to be lower. So you're almost going to get a double whammy with the interest rates. Um, so, but I'm glad you brought up this one thing, and I'll I'll end on this one piece. And I think this is also good for your investor clients who want to rent. Yeah. If you're looking for a rental package, yep. Tableau charts and look for rentals, average rental rate per square foot. If you really want to get somebody to get off the fence from renting, you just tell them you're not going to save any money by staying in your rental. What did you say, Tableau charts? Tableau charts. This is the Cromford report, Rentals, right? this is in the Cromford report. It's all MLS data. But if you click on each one of these tabs going across, uh, these five together, if you print them all, it creates a nice little package that uh, for your investor that you could just send to them or print up and give to them. But it also is a nice visual for your buyers that are like, well, I think I'm gonna wait. A 30 year fixed mortgage fixes that monthly nut for your housing. Every, and you can always refinance a lower print right down the line, but your rent is not going down. The only rent going down, I will tell you, is apartment style flat rent. That one's going down. That went down. Because they're building all those apartments. But everybody else, everybody else is up. Um, so if we look at median lease by price by quarter, that's 50% of our leases going through the MLS are below 15, 14.95 and 50% are above. Your median square footage is also declining by about 50 square feet. That's huge. Yeah, so 2017 in the, let's see, we're in, this, we just finished the second quarter. You got 1,630 square feet. You just lost 11 more square feet um, just in the last year. Um, and then you've got your most, most expensive zip codes and you've got a map as well and a color coded map to tell you where the cheapest ones are. Green is under $80 or 80 cents a square foot and orange is over 80 cents a square foot. So you can see the darker portions and but it used to be a lot more green. I tell you that this has become a lot more orange. I'm going to have to change up my colors again. Um, but between all of those, you can choose, um, say if they really want to focus on Gilbert, for, for instance, you can come in here, just focus on Gilbert. You see all the greens are and all the oranges are and then scroll up here and you've got your median is 1800 square feet here. Your most expensive zip code is 85233, least is 85297. Yeah. Median lease is 1600 uh, a month and then this is again, your per square foot is going up. So those five give you a nice, somebody's like I'm thinking about renting or buying a, a rental you can print that up really quickly through the Cromford report and, and slip it into your presentation. Just quickly, these are rental homes or rental apartments? Um, you can choose. Along the side here, you've got the type. Oh, so see. if you wanted to do just a uh, patio home, single family, townhome, okay. something like that, you can. Um, or if you're trying to discourage them from buying an apartment style. Okay. You can show, you can, you can print each individual one to show them the difference between the growth rate in apartment style versus um, say even a townhouse with a garage. So an apartment style is an apartment condominium. Apartment style condominium would be like, you know, you're on the third floor, it's flat, you get a carport. Okay. That's your apartment style. Okay. Townhouses, um, you probably you may or may not have like a, a garage, but kind of attached to the unit. And then you walk right in and maybe you have multiple stories. Um, of course, there's not a lot of apartment styles in Gilbert, obviously. You would do the apartment style if you're in like downtown Phoenix or back border but still I mean those three those five things I think uh, create a nice little package for you guys so it's 2 30 um, any you. yes Would you tell us again you said you had another like seminar but it was different than what this one is what's that called again oh a market update market, update. market updates are where I come with a PowerPoint and I've gone through all the charts and I kind of create the the overview where I might say this is what's happening 
valley-wide and this is what's happening in your particular area how the southeast valley is responding how gilbert's or chandler or mesa is responding um because you know we've got the overall value at valley and then you've got your local markets and so that's what i address there so once a month if you're not getting emails from us then we may not have the right email for you because we say i actually hired somebody to send out my schedule every month for speaking so if you're not getting it make sure that in your go into if you're not getting our email be sure to go into um, your subscriptions under manage my account and make sure we have the correct email address for you and how do you get signed up through sharing yes if you guys are interested, just shoot me an email. Otherwise, I'll be sending out a, a blanket email mm -hmm. telling people what the timelines are. And yeah, and I'm always happy to, to um, if you guys want need to have more of these classes, um, we're happy to do more of them. Too. Awesome. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, so thank you guys. Yay, get a call. <laughs> and end video. <laughs> Michael Muriette? Yeah. I'm just going to stop the recording. Oh, thank you. No, go ahead. Oh, did he not call you back? We have called back and forth a number of times, but we never connected. He was sick for a while. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, you know what? We can